So yesterday we already saw what I mean by that is you take the compact set, uh, it's a compact manifold, and the Lie group, and we look at uh, all the smooth mappings into this Lie group, and with the point by operations. And uh, before we begin the construction, let's note um, let's note several things here. So um, when we were talking about this canonical manifold structure, the constructions we have done with the canonical manifold structures, uh, we well, I said several times that the charts of the target manifold are not very important. So we needed this additional structure, the so-called local addition, uh, to construct the manifold structure. However, this uh, result by Bobaki, which we just saw, um, tells us a little bit of a different story. And the idea for the proof of how you prove that this actually is a manifold, I mean, before we prove that, uh, that it is a Lie group, um, will uh, is actually going in a completely different way because this is one of the examples where the charts of the target actually induce charts of the manifolds of mappings and this is another reason why i want to present this result by uh, on how you build uh, the Lie group structures because at least this is uh, apart from the vector space case when we are mapping into a vector space and we don't really have charts this is the only instance i know where the charts of the target really um, give you charts of the um, uh, of the infinite dimension manifolds of mappings, and the insight we are going to exploit is the following. So, what was driving this Bobaki result? I mean, here, so the target already has a group structure, but what the upshot should, should be from the construction we had in the Bobaki result was um, if you have a Lie group G and you have a chart phi defined on an open subset of um, um, so here, an open subset from B into the model space, and this has the unit at um, uh, in it, so the uh, set U contains the unit. Then we can shop around the charts by, mul by left multiplication, for example. So we can look at these charts by G uh, from G times U. Now the values in B, and what it does, it transcends H to G inverse H, and then we divide the R. So, and if, or I mean, this was these charts basically constitute the atlas by which we uh, define the manifold topology, a uh, manifold structure on uh, a group which didn't have this. Uh, so it was just enough to have something at the identity, right? And then we were showing about. Now we are starting with an honest B group G. And uh, just by construction, it's clear since the group, my, uh, group operations are smooth from the, uh, on all of the Lie group, is that if we pick just an arbitrary chart at the identity, that um, we can, by pushing around this chart with multiplication, we can get an atlas for the whole Lie group, right? So, the, uh, so these new charts we construct from the one chart, they are the charts with respect to the original manifold structure. So we don't get a different manifold structure, uh, meaning that for a Lie group, it's more or less good enough to know a chart around the identity, and then we can push it around to get a chart of your else. And this is exactly the idea for the construction of this uh, current group. So we pick a chart in the uh, target Lie group around the identity, to some uh, some additional um, uh, some additional properties, and um, so since all the charts here for the um, uh, for the G arise in uh, in this way that we can or we can basically cover the whole manifold with an atlas where we have pushed around the original charts, this will give us a um, this will give us a handle on. Uh, how to construct a chart for this manifold mappings. Basically, we take the push forward of such a chart around the identity and construct a, a manifold chart for this manifold of mappings. And it will turn out in the end that uh, in this way, we also obtain a canonical manifold structure. And I've said that every uh, Lie group always admits a local addition, right? So when this is a compact manifold, we have this statement, if we are looking at smooth mappings from a compact manifold into a manifold with a local addition, then, we, uh, then there's a canonical construction for a 
economically many fold structure on the mapping space. So a priori, we could have the problem that we have now just defined two sorts of manifold structures. One using the local addition, constructing a manifold on this manifold, uh, on this uh, C infinity function using the local addition, and this trick used by, uh, or this trick from the Bobaki result. However, since both of these manifold structures turn out to be canonical, we know that canonical manifold structures are uh, unique up to diffeomorphism. So this is actually the same uh, manifold structure um, uh, in both approaches. So this is, again, one of the added benefits of knowing that something is canonical. If we have two ways of constructing a canonical manifold structure, we know automatically that whatever we have obtained is, in the worst case, diffeomorphic to each other. Right, so that we can change from one to the other. Okay, and um, so let's start with some general assumptions. So, some general assumptions for the rest of this section. So, first we will construct these. Um, current groups, and then we'll look a little bit into the structure. I mean, structure theory for current groups, and also for the more special cases, the root groups, this is a wide field. I mean, there are basically books on this topic, so we can only give a tiny hint as to why these things are interesting. Um, okay, so G will always be a Lie group. K will always be a compact manifold. And we want to fix a chart around the identity um, which then um, apparently to be noted that this is the identity I put in one here, and this is going to U. So now I'll fix that notation in E. And as we have seen yesterday, I can identify the model space with the Lie algebra of G. This will be later important because we also want to identify the Lie algebra of the current group. And then it will be convenient if we're already mapping into the Lie algebra. Um, okay, and, and now what shouldn't surprise you in light of yesterday that we built some local uh, model. I mean, basically what we will be doing, so this, again, another perspective on this Bobaki result. The Bobaki result tells us if we have something which locally looks like Lie group and we have Local group structure, we can extend this local Lie group structure to a Lie group structure. Now, obviously, when we have a Lie group, we can always contract, look at a small neighborhood, as we have done yesterday with the local addition vector, with the local multiplication uh, in the identification of the Lie bracket. And uh, so we can constrict ourselves from the from the Lie group back to the um, back to the um, uh, back to the local group. And the whole point of, of this is, uh, at least when we're in the situation where the Bobaki results are uh, applicable, so the local uh, structure we have there uh, can always be extended to the, to the original group structure. So we are actually not losing information by going to the, the smaller local picture. Um, okay. Uh, right. So this should get mapped to zero. And as we've seen yesterday, it's good if we can take the tangent at the identity of this mapping, and we want to have the identity mapping of, let me write the Lie algebra now, because the Lie algebra is the tangent space of the identity, right? So we want that the derivative is of the right kind, and uh, further, take uh, open neighborhood V1, open in U1, and set uh, the image on the pi such that v1 times v1 uh, times is contained in v1. Okay. Uh, last remark function spaces. Uh, always carry the Compact open C infinity topology, just in case there are any questions. I mean, in the end, I was announcing we get a canonical manifold structure. So we want um, now, of course, also that 
um, the topology is the right one. Okay, now we have all these prerequisites, and let's start with our construction. Uh, I just want to recall, I mean, this is exactly the setup we used yesterday to build a local model of our multiplication on some open subset of the tension space, right? And uh, just to fix notation, we do that again. Um, I don't want to use stars anymore because there will be some push forwards coming in the uh, in the proof. So I use now for the local multiplication. I use the mapping. Uh, I, have, I call this mu. Um, so this is mu of x y is exactly given by phi of phi inverse x phi inverse y. So this is just the local multiplication process on the identification of the Lie algebra, and uh, we now give mu uh, name iota from B uh, to B uh, iota of x. So this will be the inverse for the local multiplication. Uh, this is phi of phi inverse of x. And then I have to invert here. So this is the group inverse. And uh, so I pull the x back into the group, invert it there, and push it back. Um, ah. Copy to do that. I should have required that uh, we want this and uh, such that v times v is in u1. And okay, while we're at it, uh, let's require in addition that v1 inverse is the same as v1, so that we are actually sure that we are always in the in the same setting, right? So we are we're requiring that this is symmetric. Okay. Right, so let's see. Um, okay, so we now want to study the smooth mappings from K to the gradient infinity. So this carries the compact open C infinity topology. And because K is compact, the space or the subset K uh, of all smooth mapping from K with values in U1, this is an open subset, right? So U1 is open in G, and uh, this can just be written as the compact open neighborhood. All functions which are smooth from K with the uh, with images in U1. Um, so this is, uh, we use this as a short notation. I mean, it would be more correct to use this one because, uh, okay, uh, no, that, that's okay. So um, this is an open subset with respect to the C infinity quality. And um, we know um, that this manifold here, uh, and the corresponding one, so remember U was just this guy. So the image of u1 under phi. So this is, uh, or these are canonical. Uh, no, sorry. The second one is a canonical manifold, right? So I'm using here that from k uh, going from a compact manifold to an open subset of the locally convex space. We have proved that this is a canonical manifold in uh, ah, okay, so actually it was an exercise two, so this is exercise two, three, two. This basically builds on our proof of the exponential law, right? So the exponential law is infinite. And now we have a bijection. We have phi uh, star, so the push forward to phi. This gives us. Bijection, since both of these guys carry the compact open C infinity topology, this is actually a homeomorphism. Right? So, why is this a homeomorphism? Uh, the inverse is phi inverse star. Okay. And we have, we have this proof that, um, um, yeah, so we have, we, have, we have this proof that in the compact open C infinity topologies, push forwards are. Uh, continuous, 
right? So I'm just using continuity here now. I mean, actually, looking a little bit closer at what's going on, uh, um, so this will, this will be smooth, but to be just on the safe side so that we don't have to worry about smoothness and uh, whether this structure here let's see, uh, on the C infinity function from K, whereas in U1 is canonical, we just declare the phi star to be a diffeomorphism. So we don't want to worry about is this here really a canonical manifold? We know that the topology is right, so the topology is preserved, and then afterwards we declare uh, declare um, phi star to be a diffeomorphism. And this means that we now have a canonical manifold structure on the C infinity function K to U1. Uh, from K, uh, sorry, from K to, uh, to U, U was the thing sitting, sitting inside of the U. Okay, and the upshot of this is uh, since with respect to the canonical manifold structure, push forwards are smooth, we see uh, that um, if we push forward the multiplication as of yes the, the multiplication from um, the infinity k u times the infinity k uh, oh no, so the infinity k v1 and the infinity k v1 taking values in the infinity k u. So what we u1, so we see that this is a smooth mapping because on one hand the manifold structure is canonical and when we could even argue, so this map, if we uh, put it back using this diffeomorphism between C infinity k u1 and C infinity k u. Uh, this mapping gets identified with the push forward of the mapping mu, right? And similarly, uh, the push forward with the, uh, with the inversion mapping of the uh, of the V group um, gets on the set v1 uh, pushed to the push forward uh, of this mapping yota, right? And the yota uh, is, uh, and the push forward of yota is smooth as a mapping on uh, C infinity k, um, C infinity k b. I mean, basically, it depends on how you want to see it. Either we say, well, because this manifold structure on C infinity k one is uh, canonical, we see that push forwards are smooth. The NG and also the inversion in the Lie group are smooth on, uh, if we restrict them to V1 times V1 with values in U1. And then we push forward with it, canonical manifold suggests that they're the smooth. Or we use uh, the, uh, the different morphs we have here to say, well, it gets conjugated to push forward, which is smooth on the other one. Right? So it doesn't really matter what uh, it is. Yes? Uh, it might be that I'm focusing on the wrong thing here, but. You're saying that the C infinity K to U1 is the base in this C infinity topology, like a couple of lines up? Yes. But isn't U1 in the Lie group? And the C infinity topology or the base should be with open sets in a locally convex vector space? No, I mean, we defined, we defined the. Um we defined uh, we defined the C infinity topology also for manifold value points. Okay. So the uh, the trick there was basically uh, okay. Let me let me just remind you of, of how this was defined. The question. Uh, okay. I mean, we did it first for vector spaces, but then um, the upshot was how do you define it on manifolds? Um, so this is defined on many points as follows. So if I let me just write it down for arbitrary many points. Uh, see infinity from M to N 
So you topologize it by putting it into this C infinity TKM uh, here with the compact open topology. We only need topological spaces. We take the TKM and we send F to the terminals of all these parts. Right? And um, what you can, uh, what was part of an exercise is to show. We have defined it differently or somewhat differently when the target was a vector space uh, because these iterated tangent maps have a lot of redundant information. I mean, they you get basically when you look at this component wise, so this has two to the power of k components, whereas the usual uh, uh, derivatives we take to define the uh, compact open simple values in vector space only has k components. However, you can basically, by reordering and looking at the components, um, you see that the uh, components of uh, these mappings, which may, do not make sense in many fold setting, but in the, uh, in the vector space setting, those are the ones you want to be uh, using to define uh, the, uh, the topology. So it turns out that these mappings appear as part, uh, in coordinates appear as partial maps of those. And the other uh, entries which are which are appearing in the TK, uh, which are blowing up the whole thing to uh, two k uh, two to the power of k components, uh, they are actually just copies of those. Yeah? So there's a lot of redundant information going on. And you can show basically that uh, if the target is a vector space, we don't need to take those. We can just take those uh, things. Uh, okay, so that was the compact open C infinity topology. Um, now we are basically set to uh, good to go. So we have now the situation um, that we have a neighborhood of the identity mapping of, I mean, okay, let's, let me just put it here and then we will see what we've done. So actually we are, we are already halfway there uh, of getting everything the Bobaki result asks us to check, right? So we have a local neighborhood of the identity mapping, uh, the V1, uh, with a manifold structure such that uh, the group multiplication and the group um, inversion are smooth on these neighborhoods. Um, but before uh, to see this, let me just write in a three or three theorem. Uh, so the point-wise operations from the infinity group into a leak group. And we call this even a current group. Okay. Uh, it's the algebra. Is given by the C infinity functions from K with values in the algebra with pointwise bracket. And this structure here, this Lie algebra is called the current Lie algebra. Um, right. So let, let's just, uh, before we prove this, let's just think for a moment. So if we have the pointwise operation, that means we have pointwise multiplication, pointwise inversion of uh, smooth mappings in the image here. What is the unit element in this group? If we take the current group, what should be the unit element of the current group? Okay. 
areas. Yes, exactly. So the, the unit of uh, let's write it like this: the unit of the scene uh, finite functions based on the root g is the one which sends every k to the unit of g. Right. So uh, this is the unit element. Let's see how this goes. What we already, I mean, basically, we just want to apply this for what we desire now, right? So, this is why we do this. Okay, so what we already know we have um, a group, we have this, uh, so this sits inside of our current group. This is a manifold. We have the smaller set, V1, such that The following is true with respect to the multiplication. So we have so infinity A. Uh, so the product of those two things is in U1. And also, when we take the inversion, this is the same. So this is a symmetric set. And this is now re the reason for this is because we find that the V1 is a symmetric set. Right, so all the inverses are in there and pointwise in what we say in V1. Okay, and we know already that multiplication and inversion is smooth, restricted to the V1. And um, this is great, obviously, because um, let's go back to our uh, proposition. So uh, let me just share the screen for a moment here. Great. So we are in the situation. We have a group. We have subsets. One uh, the subset V is an open subset of U. We know that the V is symmetric. We know that the product of V with itself is in U. We know that the inversion and the multiplication maps are smooth on the subset. So we already get a unique manifold structure on the subgroup, and actually we have seen in Bobaki's group that we get a unit uh, that we get a unique manifold structure from all of the current group, um, such that this G naught, everything which can be generated from the set uh, C infinity K V one, is um, the Lie group. Okay, and we have the same manifold structure as before. Good. So. This, uh, so we actually already have proved that we get on some subgroup G0 a leaf group structure. Now we are greedy, of course, we don't want G0, we want all of it. Right? So um, we now have to uh, see that also the um, second part of the Robaki theorem is true. So we have to assume that for each G in a generating set, there is some open neighborhood such that the conjugation is uh, smooth here and uh, again contained in U. Okay, and let's uh, let's see. I mean, the conjugation with respect to the current group is, of course, also uh, just the pointwise conjugation with elements. So we can leverage that we already know that G is the group. And let's uh, do this. Let's see how it works. So. Um, Um, so we already know uh, we have all requisites of um, the one uh, first point. Now we need to check the thing of the conjugation. Okay, and for this reason, uh, let's take let's look at the gamma, just an arbitrary element in uh, the C infinity function root k with values in g. So we'll show actually that this second condition in the Bobakti theorem is true not for some generators, but actually for all of the, of the elements in the group. 
right? And uh, that's uh, certainly sufficient for what for all purposes. Okay. So, um, right. Um, we have the smooth mapping, and then we have to exploit that the image of this guy is a compact subset of our, of our target. So now here comes a little argument, right? So we, we will now exploit the compactness. Okay. Um, right. So um, we're using compactness. Um, there exists uh, one neighborhood. Let's call it W1. Um, this should be open in V1. Uh, and, and <coughs> open neighborhood. So at this also gamma of okay. K. This should sit now in the P. P is open in G. And what is the meaning of, uh, of this? So what is the relation between the W1 and the P such that um, for all P in P, we have P W1, P inversely conjugate with these two guys, and this should then be contained in uh, U1. Right? How do you do it? Typical compactness argument to show um, that um, for uh, uh, for every element here in, in K, there in gamma of K, you find in a small neighborhood with these properties so that this stays in U1. This is possible because the W uh, because we, uh, we have the unit inside of W1. Then you cover it with finitely many, you intersect them all, and then and this is this is how you do it. And uh, uh, while you intersect all the Ws, we take the union of these uh, of, of, the, of the open subsets in which one which is possible. Right. This all boils down to the smoothness, and actually boils down to the continuity of the group operations of the leap. It's not really nice. Okay, so that's the typical compactness argument we are not doing here. Okay, um, so this is staying inside of one. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we have now. Um, since the mapping C dependent on P times uh, W1, and we set, set this up to be what? Uh, to be uh, to the mapping, um, ah, sorry, going to U1, and obviously we take P and we take W and send it to. The conjugation with P is W. So, or in other words, this is just P, W, P inverse. So, this is smooth. Okay, I mean, nothing, no, not much is happening here, right? Because this is just a smoothness of the group operations now restricted to some open subsets, so that makes sense. Um, okay. So, what we can, uh, so this is smooth. Uh, so is the following map. So I can define my map H gamma. So I take phi. Uh, of T of gamma composed with phi inverse. Okay, so what this is doing, basically I want to express now everything using the local operations we have here. Right, so what this is, uh, let's say, let, let, let me show you what this H gamma is evaluated in point K and in a W, uh, so, yeah, well, in a W where W is now an element of phi of W1. Right, so let's 
just quickly run through this. So this is phi of something. This is phi of c of gamma of k. And then phi inverse of the w. Or in other words, this is phi of gamma of k, w gamma of k inverse. So this is conjugating this one w element with the image of k under, uh, under gamma, and then uh, pushing it back into the, into the local coordinates. OK. Uh, right. So why, I mean, it's, you can argue that it's now a bit superfluous to work in local coordinates since we have this diffeomorphism. I could also just invoke the, I mean, the argument I'm, as I'm writing it down is using that uh, C, in, uh, so we have now this neighborhood C infinity, K phi of W1. Uh, this is an open neighborhood and C infinity K of U. Originally, our canonical manifold, this was the original canonical manifold. We have to clear, uh, declare this to be isomorphic to the C infinity functions from K with values in U1. So I'm giving you the argument now in local coordinates using this chart phi again. This is somewhat superfluous since the only thing which is happening from the point of view of the many parts of mappings is that I'm composing with this diffeomorphism push forward with phi, right? And okay, I mean this H gamma is now living on uh, is, is now living um, on uh, it's, it's basically taking local coordinates, but since I have the diffeomorphism the push forward, that wouldn't be necessary. I could just disregard using all these phi's and just define the mapping on uh, on the D group and uh, look instead of the C infinity function from K with values in U uh, at the C infinity function from K with values in U1. This wouldn't actually change anything because I know that my manifold is canonical up to this diffeomorphism. But just perhaps it's a bit more easy to use this diffeomorphism to just uh, remember where this canonical structure is coming from. Okay. Anyway, let's go ahead. And see what this gets us. What I claim now basically is um, that on this neighborhood, we just had the second uh, condition of Bovaki. So that we know now, I mean, when we push with this H gamma, we see, uh, so this is implementing the, um, the conjugation action, right? And we will see that this H gamma gives rise to a smooth conjugation on these uh, manifolds of mappings. And this is then exactly the second condition we have in the Bobaki theorem. Um, All right. So since the infinity K U is canonical, we see that uh, the mapping H gamma box. You remember the box, right? So because I, I and in the induction notes we have a star, but since I can't do two stars, we, uh, we have a box here. So this is now a mapping from C infinity K pi W1, taking values in C infinity K U. And what it does, it takes an F and sends it to H gamma. We take the identity on K. And then we insert the F here in the second component. And if we unravel this, uh, what the meaning is, so this is smooth. And indeed, for this guy, we just said that this is the same as we take gamma 
one I need to be a bit careful here so we actually take um this is x going in here. So I'm take phi composed with gamma multiply with f multiply with phi composed with gamma and then phi oh, sorry no uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, actually I compose this with phi inverse phi inverse composed with f gets multiplied from the left and from the right and the gamma and then so this is the formula on the function space which I get. So we see again this is just the local model of the conjugation and if I pipe that again through the diffeomorphism between this guy and the set uh, on the, the, the manifold C infinity from K with values in U1 we see that on the nose this proves the smoothness of the conjugation action with respect to this mapping gamma. It's just that here everything is wrote, uh, written in local coordinates, so this is smooth. Therefore, uh, on so the conjugation with mapping gamma is now a smooth map from k with values in w1 to the infinity k with values in u1, and uh, thus we shown that the second condition of uh, the four one holds. This means the C infinity functions in K with G with contrast multiplication are the legal. And if you are interested in what are the charts, then it's just so we have a chart which is just the push forward with this chart phi. Right? This is this is our uh, this is our chart, and we push this chart around using the pointwise multiplication. So this is the this now set so at least the question whether it's a Lie group. Now we want to identify the Lie algebra right? that was claimed in addition. Identify the Lie algebra. Note that I start from C infinity k with values in u1 to C infinity k with values in u, and this is an open subset of C infinity k with values in the Lie algebra. Is a chart. Around the identity of um, the yes, around the identity of what is called uh, uh, yes, not the current. Okay, and Exploit that what is there T phi at the identity of G. This is just the identity of the Lie algebra. 
Okay. And in this case, we can take what happens if you take t at one now with respect to the current group. Of the push forward. Then uh, let me cheat for, for a slight little moment. Let me justify this in a moment. So we know that if I take the tangent of a push forward, this is the push forward with the tangent. Okay, so this is the push forward of the identity. Now, there should be a question here because in the chapter on function spaces, we have done this in the case we have a local addition, right? And not just a canonical manifold structure. So the point was we needed the local addition to get, I mean, on one hand, we could, I could argue, well, it's a D group, and if we wait a little, uh, a little while, I'll show you that there is a local addition, right? So we can actually identify the tangent space. But this is a little bit. Uh, uh, this is perhaps not what we want because, um, well, so this Bobaki result allowed us to completely ignore <laughs> that, uh, uh, that we have a local addition. So that what we needed, we did not need a local addition to, to use the Bobaki result. Um, when you look at why we need a local addition in the proof to identify these tangent spaces, the, the main reason why we want the local addition was if we have a local addition on a manifold, we also get a local addition on the tangent of the manifold. And we needed this to ensure that the C infinity function with value in the tangent bundle, with values in the tangent bundle, again form a canonical manifold. Right? So it's uh, so in general it's not clear. So then you have this one. We have now a manifold, uh, a canonical manifold. And if it was an arbitrary thing we get here in the target. We would have no clue where this is also now a canonical manifold of mappings. Um, actually, I'm, uh, I'm uh, already assuming that we have that you that you have gone through the exercise proving that what we have, whatever we uh, produce in the Bobaki result is a canonical manifold of mappings. Uh, but uh, this is an exercise to show that this manifold structure is canonical. However, we are in a much better situation. We have learned that if G is a Lie group then also the tangent bundle of the Lie group is a Lie group again. So we know automatically that this is not an arbitrary manifold. So in principle, if we want to identify the Lie algebra, we could use the same trick. We built a canonical manifold structure on these guys, again for this one, right? So uh, since this is a Lie group, we can just apply the Bobaki construction once again, and we know automatically that this guy here is an infinite dimension manifold mapping to canonical one. And therefore, we have this canonical identification of T, C infinity, KG. This turns out to be the same as C infinity, K, TG. The argument is exactly the same as if you had a local addition. The point is that we are exploiting that this guy here is again uh, a Lie group. And this is, and we needed this identification because that was driving our identification of the tangent mapping of the of the push forward. So we could only identify the tangent if we had an identification of the tangent bundle as something uh, um, as as the smooth function with values in the tangent bundle. And this is the justification when one wants to avoid local additions, as we want at the moment. I mean, of course, you could also say, well, I construct this local addition and then everything is fine, right? So, and then this would, would all be fine. But, um, well, I mean, the point here is that, uh, or my, the point I want to make is that we can get around without ever invoking a local addition in this construction. If we had a local addition, it would actually yield exactly the same. Okay, however, um, so um, we have this. What, uh, what this identification, because we have the identity implies, so if you take the space uh, or we compute the Lie algebra of the current group, we get as a space 
and the soon function with values in the Lee hash bar. Right? This is just now a consequence of the identification of this tangent space and the, uh, the point that we have this, this local map. Okay. So this gives us an identification of the Lee algebra. Unfortunately, it, does, it still doesn't tell us what is the Lee bracket, right? I mean, if you want to identify the Lee algebra, we know, don't only want to know what the, Lee, uh, what, the, what the space is, but we also want to know what is the Lee bracket. Okay, and how do you identify the Lee bracket? Um, so recall, or actually it's another exercise. So we have point evaluations. And this stands just gamma to gamma of x. These are um, smooth actually. I mean, if that were, if the G was vector space, that would also be linear. And if you if you look at in, in the charts we have here, they uh, they become smooth. So actually, what you can prove is that these point evaluations here are Lie group morphisms. This, the reason is because we have here the point-wise multiplication. First, multiply two things point-wise, evaluate in a point. This is the same as if we first evaluate and then multiply. Right? So these guys here are Lie group morphisms by how they are built. And it's an exercise. I mean, what's that's not clear directly right off the bat is that they are smooth with respect to uh, the Bobaki group structure. Uh, but this is an exercise. Okay, so at this point evaluation, they are smooth. And uh, we see that, oh, since this is a Lie group morphism, I can compute a Lie algebra morphism. And the small computation just shows, I mean, up to this identification, what is this Lie algebra morphism? Uh, this is just so if I take L and X of a bracket, gamma eta, when you run through what it means, hey, I mean, let's take the curve uh, definition or something. So it turns out that this the derivative of the point of variation. It's just the point of variation, but now on this space. So what you get here is this is gamma eta evaluated in X. Okay. However, similarly, uh, since this is a Lie algebra homomorphism, we see that this here is the same as if we apply our Lie algebra homomorphism now to the things and then compute the bracket afterwards. Well, and this, since this is just the evaluation, what this shows, if we evaluate our Lie bracket on the, on the current algebra, then we see that this is just the bracket of the pieces we had evaluated. Right? And so, this shows that point-wise, the Lie bracket of the of this uh, of this current algebra is the point-wise bracket of the elements in the current algebra. So the point here was, um, and this is the nice part of uh, having crawled through all of these definitions. Um, since we already know that we have a Lie group here, automatically this point-wise Lie bracket. Will be continuous. This, I mean, it will be a continuous big bilinear map on uh, the current Lie algebra, and so we don't need to worry about continuity or smoothness and so forth. I mean, this is also clear actually because it's just the push forward with the uh, with the with the Lie bracket here. But um, anyway, it's nice to see that uh, once you know that you have uh, a, a Lie. A, and Lie group and the associated Lie algebra, all the continuity problems and so forth, and the existence of the Lie bracket is solved by these meta theorems that every Lie group has an associated Lie algebra. The only question we had was to identify these structures. What is the formula giving us the Lie bracket? What is the formula for the um, Lie algebra? Okay. So and this <laughs> concludes the proof. So we have everything we stated. We have constructed these current groups. We have constructed the current Lie algebra. There's one last statement, which I want to give you about the 
or in the last general uh, statement about so, okay, this completes the proof uh, about the structure of these uh, current groups. Let's do this quickly. And this is the fourth five proposition. So you might be, I mean, yesterday I, I said when, when we talked about regular Lie groups, there are several steps of constructing a new Lie group. First, you want to construct the Lie group. Okay, we're done with that. Then you want to construct, uh, you want to identify C algebra. We've also done that. Third step, you want to see that it's regular, right? And so the next proposition should be no surprise because it states if G is a regular Lie group, then the current group is regular. Okay, so regularity is inherent by current groups. And yesterday when we talked about locally exponential, uh, as a consequence of this result, you will, you will see that uh, if the Lie group G is locally exponential, also the current group is locally exponential. Right. So this is this gives you a plethora of new uh, of new uh, infinite dimensional uh, groups which are not models of bar space which are locally exponential. Right. So for example, taking things which have G is finite dimensional, then uh, so the current group is equal to zero. Yes. Yeah. Because something that is quite often increases G is just yeah something like SL something yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me let me just give you the proof, which is not very hard, but we need to invoke the uh, exponential law. Um, one comment. So I want to use uh, the exponential law for the space. The infinity from 0, 1 with values in the current group. And strictly speaking, I mean, this is a, this is not many for it. That's, that's not a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, one, one, one can show that, the, that this thing also, um, I'm sorry, wrong. Yeah, I want to write this one, right? So this is a locally convex space, we have no problem. However, we haven't proved the exponential law, strictly speaking, for this situation, because this, many, this is a manifold with boundary. It has these two boundary points, right? However, if you revisit our proof of the exponential law, uh, the proof goes through, let's say, at least for this interval, and you can actually prove the exponential law for a compact manifold with a very general type of boundary. And uh, in the lecture notes, you'll find the reference to where this is done in the literature. I chose basically to give you only the boundary as version because then we never need to really talk about how to deal with manifolds of having spawn boundaries. Because this is the only place where this will really once show up. Uh, and the boundary here is very simple, right? Because we have an interval just with boundary points. We don't have any complicated behavior. So at this moment, I'm just saying we will just use this exponential law without any further explanation of how you prove it. At least for this, uh, for compact intervals, the proof is actually the same. But uh, you can prove a version of this exponential law for uh, manifolds with boundary also where the boundary is, I mean, where the manifold is uh, several dimensional and, and uh, you find some boundaries. So this, again, the compactness is important. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so we, have, uh, we obtain a canonical isomorphism uh, theta, which uh, is of the following kinds so of the infinity from 0, 1. This is now, uh, this is now due to the um, exponential law, the infinity uh, from k with values in Lg. This is isomorphic to the infinity k, uh, sorry. 0, 1 times k with values in Lg. And of course, as you might have noticed, I can 
mix, uh, I mean, in a Cartesian product, I can just, um, well, we can flip the order of the arguments in the computer, but it doesn't change. So basically, what this uh, space is also isomorphic to, it's isomorphic to the smooth functions from K with values in the smooth functions from 0, 1, and G by applying the uh, converse direction of the, of the exponential law. Right? And the trick is we just uh, flip the order of the arguments and apply the exponential law. Okay, um, so what we see here is um, the matter H. This is the small level of G. And then we, ah, actually, that theta here, uh, small level G. I pushed forward with the small level. This is something which uh, pushes from the C infinity function of values in the Lie algebra to the C infinity function, uh, sorry, to the Lie group, right? So remember the small level of G was C infinity from 0, 1 with values in G smooth, since we are regular, to G, right? And then I compose this with my map theta. So this is a smooth map. Um, yeah, this is a smooth map. So this is a smooth map from uh, C infinity, 0, 1, with values in the current group. And it goes to C infinity, K, with values in the, yeah, sorry, this that takes values in the current B algebra, whereas this is the current group, right? So we are just pushing forward with the evaluation up to a flip of the uh, um, of the of the uh, of the arguments here in these C infinity functions, right? And in a certain extent, what the what the argument is, we think of a smooth function with values in smooth function as just a, uh, something in two variables, and then we flip the two variables to go to the right function spaces to make everything work. Okay, so this is smooth. Uh, as the small evolution map is smooth. And um, okay, let's see. Mm, right, so let's see that it also gives us the right uh, well, we have to see that this is now. So, what I claim is that this guy here is the small evolution map of the current group. Right? So, in the one hand, here, we want that it solves. The Lie type differential equations. And that I mean, now we have, a, we have a nice smooth map and it associates to some smooth path into the current algebra associates so elements in the current group. All we have to see is that they solve the right differential equation. Okay. Let's see whether this is true. And I mean, the way how do you see this? We are just uh, using the point evaluations again to, to identify what we have there. As I mean. Since everything is pointwise in the current group, just uh, letting the point evaluations loose will tell us that uh, pointwise these differential equations are exactly the ones we, we expect they are. Right? So, um, okay, uh, we're very wrong, not here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we have again the point evaluation, the Lie group morphisms. Infinity. Um, K, G, P, G, that's my Lie group morphisms. So uh, the Lie algebra version of this was just uh, and theta to X. 
And so what happens if I take out my evaluation map on this mapping page? So it turns out that this is the same as I evolve in G. What do I involve? I take the L uh, of Fx and I push forward with this. Okay. This formula might seem to be a bit mysterious now. Where is this coming from? Um, so here we have the push forward. Uh, let's see, these are the arguments correct? But I need, I'm missing a theta somewhere. Okay, it doesn't matter. So um, we base, uh, so there's basically an exercise which uh, will tell you that Lie group morphisms play nicely with the evolution map. So the evolution map has something to do. Basically, there's there's a formula if you have two regular Lie groups. And you're, uh, you're plugging in the Lie algebra morphism coming from the Lie group morphism into the evolution map or the push forward of the Lie algebra morphism that this plays nicely in this way with the, uh, with the evolution map of the other. Okay. And uh, right. So since the evaluation maps separate. The points of the current group. This shows or this identity. That uh, uh, H is actually the evolution map of the current group. And so up to this flip of, uh, of, um, of arguments, the, uh, the push forward with the evolution map of the underlying group gives us the, uh, the evolution map of the current group. In a certain sense, we should have expected that, right? Because on the current group, when we formulate the D-type equations, they are formulated by pointwise uh, taking D-type equations. So we're just we're just adding another parameter uh, to the to the whole equation, and what this thing is just saying is okay. When uh, we are um, we are just uh, by this swap of the parameters here, we have a, from zero one the values in the current algebra. Um, we think of the k here just as an additional parameter. And we are solving a parametric version of the Lie type equations. And what this whole identity and this identification says, so what you're thinking here is, um, um, so you're in a way freezing the, uh, the parameter in K. So you see this is a parameter. Uh, then you are solving the differential equation on the target group. And you see that you can do this for every parameter K. And this gives you sort of a parametric family of, of these knee type equations, which are smoothly parametrized by the elements in your compact manifold K. And this is the meaning of this equation, right? So this is the, the, the real, this is the, uh, so this justifies that we really get the uh, solutions to the pointwise, uh, that the solutions to the pointwise equation, uh, when we think of the, uh, the element in K as a parameter, are actually uh, or glue back together if you want to the solution of the lead type equation on the current group, right? So this is what is behind all of this argument. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to worry about differentiability because we know from function space uh, properties that all of these operations were smooth, so all of these transformations were smooth and so forth. Um, the only thing which was the question, but this is well, clear if you go just, I mean, to see better what is going to happen, just insert some uh, some function and see what is what is going on. Then we we'll, then we immediately see that this equ uh, equation here is correct. So it basically tells you that uh, 
the solutions to the lead type equation on the current group are given by pointwise solving the uh, lead type equations in the target group for every parameter k. And then we lose k for all of them. Right. So this was the last uh, thing I wanted to prove about the current groups. There are actually a few more, um, a few more, uh, two pages actually on uh, uh, some special situations, namely uh, root groups and gauge groups. So they can be uh, they can be identified with well, the assumption. I mean, the root group is just a special case where for the compact manifold K, we have just the circle. So it's clear that we get this as a as a um, as a special case. So the nice part of piece about root groups is, or the, but some, somewhat surprising, as soon as you write here the circle as one as a domain, you get a loop group, and there's a lot more known about loop groups when you compare this to the general case of current groups. So they have been very well studied. There's this big book by Presley and Siegel, um, which is called Loop Groups, I, I believe. Uh, so it's a whole book on stuff and on the representation theory of, of loop groups, so a lot is known there. And the gauge groups, um, they also arise for, as the name suggests, the gauge theories in physics. They can be identified with certain subgroups of these current groups. Um, since we are now at the end of, of today's lecture, we are not going to do this now. Um, I will see whether it works. I don't want to start with this next time. Uh, I will probably just produce another video. So in case you want to uh, learn a little bit more about gauge groups, uh, we'll just uh, outsource this to YouTube. Right? And uh, well, sure. No, I'm, I'm, I will. I will set this up as a, as a Zoom session. So in case you really want to listen directly to it, uh, so there will be. During one of the next weeks, I don't know when, there will be a Zoom session uh, where I will talk about loop groups and the gauge groups of the material from the lecture notes. And uh, because I want to start next time in November fresh uh, with everything uh, Riemannian metric related. So we are now basically done with infinite dimensional loop groups. And the next time, uh, I mean, they might appear once or twice, but uh, in principle, the next time we are talking about Riemannian geometry on infinite dimensional spaces. Okay. So stop that.